that B is proportional to the identity matrix. So there's just some number that multiplies in there. Okay? That's the first sure lemma. Um, extremely important result and happily very easy to prove. So, so let's see why this is easy to prove. We're, we're going to use the following piece of information. So let's see if I can make this clear. This is the only thing that we've really got in our back of our minds when we're proving both of Schur's lemmas. And I think it's quite a simple idea. Um, <coughs> so we've got a matrix which is, uh, um, if, if we are in a reducible rep, we've got a matrix structure that looks like this. Gamma of T, I is equal to, and now this thing is block diagonal. So we've got maybe representation one of T, I, representation two of T, I. Um, representation 3 and noughts off the diagonal and so this thing keeps going. If I act with this matrix on any vector in my space um, so let me imagine that I'm now acting on a vector so gamma of t is going to act on some state some ket v so I'm going to write v explicitly now so here is my column vector. When this first matrix acts, it may shuffle these first entries amongst each other. So it may shuffle those first entries amongst each other. But one thing that it will not do, this matrix, because it's block diagonal, is not able to mix elements from these different bands. So if I act with this matrix on this vector, these entries do not mix. So let's say I switched on some entry over here, and these were all noughts. I could act with all of the elements of the group, and I would never be able to switch any of these elements on. I would just shuffle maybe these elements amongst each other. Is that clear? Okay, if you don't believe me, write down a couple of examples and try to act on a vector and see if that's true or not. Okay, now let's try to see why is um, Schur's lemma true. Well, we're going to start off, so, so let's prove the first lemma. We're going to start off and let's say that you give me this matrix B. What I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the eigenvalues of B. So let's say that I'm only smart enough to calculate one eigenvector. So I calculate that one. And I get B acting on, um, let's say, lambda. Gives me lambda onto lambda. So I found that eigenvalue. And what I'm going to do is now, I'm just going to take this single eigenvalue, and I'm going to say, split the vector space into two pieces. So let's split our vector space. Um, into two sets. Um, those that belong to the space, uh, I should say subspace, spanned by eigenvectors of B with eigenvalue equal to lambda. Okay? So that's going to be a subspace. So I'm thinking some of these um, eigenvectors of B will have eigenvalue lambda. Maybe it's just one. Maybe it's a couple of eigenvectors. But I'm going to say take all of those eigenvectors, and those will span a subspace. And then I've got the rest of the space, so I've split it into two. So that's in the one part, and then into here, I include the rest of the <coughs> space. Now my logic is going to be the following. I'm going to try to show, in fact, that this is so big that it is the whole space. If this is the whole space, that means every single vector has got eigenvalue lambda. But the only matrix that has every single eigenvector with the same eigenvalue is a multiple of the unit matrix. So that's the logic of the proof. Anybody want me to repeat that logic? Okay. 
So, so now let's take a look. Let's see how can we prove this. Well, let's now use Schur's lemma. We know the following. <coughs> so we act with, um, so let's take gamma of T B, and we're going to let it act on this eigenvector. And we know that this will be equal to B gamma of T acting on this eigenvector. Okay? When B acts on lambda, what do I get? Lambda. So this is lambda times by gamma of T lambda is equal to B times by gamma of T lambda. Okay? So what I'm now saying is, if I let B act on gamma of T times lambda, in fact, the gamma of T times lambda is an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda. But what I've said is, <coughs> my representation is irreducible. It can't be written in this form. In other words, I can't have components of vectors that don't mix with the rest of the vector. So if I now let T run over the whole group, because my rep is not of this form, all of these components will mix. So as I let t range over any vector, this vector over here has to span the entire space. Is that clear? Should I say it again? OK. So what I'm saying is the following. <clears throat> this is not what we've got, right? So we said in our statement of, the, of Schur's lemma, we said that we have an irreducible representation. OK. If we have an irreducible representation, we don't have this. Okay, we do not have that. If we did have this, what would we have? I would be able to switch on just one element of the vector here, and I wouldn't be able to switch on the other elements, right? I don't have this. If I've just switched on one element of the vector, I will be able to switch on all other elements by acting with matrices from the group. Everyone happy with that? So as I let gamma of t vary when it's acting on lambda, it doesn't matter what initial lambda I started with, this vector will span the whole space. So what that means is you can plug in any vector from the space into here, and they will all have eigenvalue lambda. So what I've been able to show is every single vector in the space has eigenvalue lambda. The only matrix with all of its eigenvalues equal to the same number is just a multiple of the identity. Everyone happy with that? Anyone who's still not quite sure? If you feel shy, come and talk to me during tea time. Okay? This is a real important result. A huge number of things follow from this, so I'd really suggest that you, you master this. This is, this is important if you want to understand group theory. Okay, <clears throat> so that was the first of Shaw's lemmas. He's got a second one. But before we get to it, I want to see if we can put some, um, give ourselves some intuition about this result. Um, what was our original problem? Well, our original problem was we wanted to find a label for something like, say, an electron. And what we wanted, we wanted to make sure that that label wouldn't change under a transformation. Okay? So what was our state? Well, our initial electron state may have been psi. And then what I wanted to do is I wanted to act on that initial state with gamma of t, and I wanted all of these different states to have the same eigenvalue. That's what I said was a good label. And... Um, <coughs> What did I say was a good label? Well, I said O hat, which was equal to um, the Hamiltonian squared minus P dot P. And now I'm dropping certain factors of C. We said that this was going to be a good label, right? OK. Now, if this is a good label, it means that all of these states will have the same eigenvalue of O hat. And that means that when I act with O hat on gamma of t psi, so let's say that O hat acting on psi was equal to m squared acting on psi. Um, then if I act with O hat gamma of t on psi, I still want this to be equal to m squared gamma of t psi. 
This is just m squared times by psi, so I can write that as gamma of t o hat psi. So if I now compare that to that, I'm getting something that looks very similar to this, which appears in the statement of Schuer's lemma. And what I also want, I would like O hat acting on any electron wave function to give me m squared. So I want O hat to be proportional to the identity. Well, if I want O hat to be proportional to, to the identity, and I know that that's true, then I think it's very natural to say the electron must be an irreducible representation. So it now makes sense to identify particles in the theory with irreducible representations of the group of transformations that we're looking at. And we would actually take, in fact, what is our symmetry group? Lorentz symmetry, right? So our task would be to take a look at the, the, the Lorentz group and to take a look at all of the irreducible representations of the Lorentz group. And this should now be a prediction. We should be able to see these particles in nature. So, so now you can see we're getting closer to being able to answer the original question that we asked. Now let's take a look at Schur's second lemma. Okay, and you know what? I think I'm not going to prove this one with you. Um, and, unless you want to see the proof. Is it instructive to see the proof? This proof is a bit longer. Maybe I'll leave the proof of this, but we'll prove some other things which are important. Okay, so let's take a look at the second lemma. <coughs> um, And what the second of Schur's lemma says is the following. It says, now, now this is a statement about two irreducible representations. So, so we consider <coughs> two irreducible reps, so irreps, Consider two irreps, and they are inequivalent. So, irreducible, can't make them block diagonal. Inequivalent, they are not related by similarity transform. So we know what we're talking about. Um, and we're going to call them gamma of t and gamma prime of t. So those are the two representations. And they are of dimension b and d prime, respectively. OK? Um, if we can find a d by d um, matrix such that <coughs> gamma of t a is equal to a gamma prime of t then A is the zero matrix. So that's the second of his lemmas. And as I said before, these are real important. If you wanted to prove this, the reason why it gets a little bit tedious is that you have to consider three cases. Well, that's the proof that I know. And the, the three cases correspond to taking d less than d prime, d greater than d prime, or d equal to d prime. OK? Um, and I guess if you look at any decent group theory book, they will go through the proof. The basic idea, however, is just this one. It's just using that idea again. So as long as you understood that, it should be easy to prove, well, possible to prove the lemma. OK. <coughs> So we're not going to prove that, but we will prove a consequence following from Schur's lemmas, and this maybe is 